What's your name? My name is Crimson Dawn. My name is Eloise. My name is Larry Flint. My name is Petey. <laughs> um, how long has skateboarding been part of your life? Long time. About four decades. Four, 40 years-ish. Um, Somewhere in that vicinity. When did you start Skull Skates and where? Uh, I started Skull Skates with my older brother in... Uh, I started the shop in 1976 and then Skull Skates, the brand, uh, officially came out in 1978. Where? Where did you start Skull Skates? <laughs> uh, yeah, it was kind of back and forth between Saskatchewan and Vancouver, but I guess it was Regina, Saskatchewan is where it officially got going. And it was called GNC Skates, which was actually an abbreviation for Great North Country Skateboards. And then it kind of morphed into Skull Skates. And then I guess 79, 80, moved back to Vancouver. And then it's pretty much, it's mostly known as a Vancouver company. Really. Who did I look up? Who did I look up? Who's Skull Yeah, then and now. Yeah, were the influences? Punk rock, I guess. Punk rock and skateboarding and just people who are stoked to like blaze their own trail and be innovative. So uh, I'd say a bunch of bands from Vancouver, you know, DOA, the Subhumans, Pointed Sticks. Um, the skateboarders, it was like Jay Adams, Tony Alva, Shogo Kubo, sort of all those Dogtown dudes, you know. Well, that being said, um, what's your interpretation of the connection of punk rock and skateboarding, and why is it such a good fit? Uh, punk rock and skateboarding are the same thing. Like the the details are, are differ slightly, but they're the exact same thing. It's the idea of something coming into your mind, into your imagination, and then you make it into reality. You just figure it out. Skateboarding, it's the same thing. You know, you jump fences and. You look at something, an obstacle or an empty pool or something on the street and your imagination kind of takes over and you think, what could I do with this? And then you figure it out and you do it. And so punk rock, art, skateboarding, hip hop, like, you know, graffiti, it's all, I consider them all to be really the same. Surf music, like as in surf guitar music, um, you know, surfing, all this idea of just sort of pulling stuff out of your ass, I think, um, when it comes down to it, the, the sort of intricacies differ, but the, but it's all the same thing. Uh, <clears throat> everything Skull makes is uh, made in Canada. Why is that? Uh, it's not everything, but most things. It's getting more difficult, unfortunately, because uh, a lot of Canadian manufacturers are being driven out of business by large corporations and imported cheaply produced products but at this point we're still running between only 80 and 90 percent is made in Canada or if not Canada like North America um, why that is is because we like it's it's easier to keep a handle on the quality of stuff when you're making it locally but more than that we feel like people need to be employed in this country you know like skateboards cost money and if I want somebody to come and buy one of my skateboards they need to have a job and if all you think about is the bottom line and how much money you can make and you just export all those jobs to other countries then nobody here has a job anymore and of course you know there's a thing about working the conditions and quality of life in other places you know um, a lot of people that work in manufacturing jobs in other countries have pretty shitty lives and it's better for us to not endorse that if we can help it in some way what do you think about the skate industry now compared to when you first got into the business? Well, the skate industry is the same now as it's always been. It's pretty much a lot of flakes and money-hungry kooks and like knuckleheads trying to get a piece of the action. You know, same like me when I started, and I guess I still am trying to get a piece of the action to this day. But I guess the big difference is that corporations like multinationals, they all want a piece of skateboarding now. Early on, they weren't so concerned about it. The thing about it is like somehow skateboards are nerds that became the cool people. You know, like if you're into anything as much as skateboarders are into skateboarding, you're basically a nerd, but somewhere along the line, people outside of skateboarding started to consider skateboarders cool. And like, cool sells products for big companies, you know. Um, 
big shoe companies and energy drink companies, they don't give a shit about skateboarding, but um, skateboarders influence, without meaning to do so, they influence the greater um, culture. And so uh, that's important, I guess, when you're trying to sell crap that people don't need to them, you know? But it helps to shove it down their throats a bit easier if you give it some kind of cornball credibility, whether it's secondhand or ripped off or not, it doesn't seem to matter for most people. Do you, you have any advice for anyone thinking about getting into the biz? Yeah, don't do it. It's, it's fucked up, dude. There's already way too much stuff. You know, like, people should have ideas and express themselves and make stuff, but it doesn't need to be a product, you know? Make, make some art, make a sand mandala and sweep it away, you know? Like, it's okay to be creative, but I just think that everything doesn't need to be a product. Like, I, I happen to be a pretty creative dude, I think, and a lot of that is product, and a lot of the stuff that I create is never anything that's going to be sold, you know? And so it's, out of, it's all right to create something and express yourself and not have to stress about turning it into a paycheck, you know? The same way you can skateboard without any intention of ever wanting to be a sponsored skateboarder, you know? You can do it because skateboarding is rad doesn't need to be anything else other than just what it is, right? So, um, but yeah, I would say that the skateboard industry is pretty flooded, a lot of kooks, a lot of junk, and it just makes it a bit of a pain in the ass because people who are trying to get to the good stuff got to sort of weed through all the shit to get there. And, and bottom line, it doesn't matter if we're talking to skateboarding or anything else, there's too much, there's too much stuff on this product, on this planet, and most of it's um, headed straight for the landfill with a with a brief intermission on its way there, you know. What's your favorite era of skateboarding? The, all of them. All my all all eras of skateboarding are my favorite. I mean, I I, don't, I try not to get caught up into old the old the good old days or whatever, because it's we, we all we make we make every day happen when we get up and live it, you know. And so um, I don't know. I just think skateboarding is one of those things you cannot control it. You never know what direction it's going to go. There was a thing when it kind of switched from what's, I guess, commonly known as old school skateboarding to new school or street skating. And I never learned to do that stuff, but I was never mad at kids for taking it in a new direction. Um, favorite eras? You know, there was that sort of golden moment when it was sort of late 50s, early 60s. That was before I skateboarded. But it seems like surf culture, surf guitar music, custom hot rod culture, custom motorcycle culture, even though I'm not into the combustion engine, skateboarding. They, they remind me of hip-hop, like how hip-hop has its different components, but they all sort of come together as one thing. Um, I guess that, I, I don't know if I'd call that a favorite, that's one that I'm drawn to, maybe because I missed, you know, it was too late to catch it. I think they're all good, I think skateboarding right now is as amazing as it's ever been. <clears throat> Who should we interview next for this Absolute Underground? Uh, Carlos Longo. I think you should interview Carlos Longo. There's a bunch of people that you should interview, but they're dead, so it'll probably be a difficult interview. But as far as people who are alive and still walking around, I'd say Carlos Longo would be a good, good person to interview. Excellent. Yeah. <clears throat> when did you get involved with SBC, and what was your first thoughts coming into 109 East Hastings? What the fuck is the point? This is ridiculous. This will never work. Just one thought or several thoughts? Oh, just, yeah, your thoughts? Yeah, no. Uh, no, I'm joking. I thought, wow, this is this is a big... This is going to take a lot of effort to make it work. And I remember coming through with uh, you and Andrew with flashlights and going into the basement and just seeing and smelling and feeling vibes like I've never experienced before. It was pretty gnarly. And I'm, I mean, I basically put on a brave face and I think said something like, oh, no, yeah, no, this is possible. But in reality, I was thinking, this is fucked, like, this is not going to happen, you know. Which, people come in here and they look around, they look at the ramp, you know, and they go, well, it took some effort to build that ramp. And I know from, from sort of being in touch with you guys as it was developing that that ramp represents maybe 5% of the effort put into building this place, into rebuilding it. It wouldn't have made it through another winter. It was completely decrepit and falling apart. Uh, I think it's pretty amazing. I think it's awesome because in those early sort of meetings and just hanging out and talking about it, pretty much everything that you guys said you were going to do, you've done and more. So it's, yeah, I'm stoked for you.
What sort of benefits do you think SBC has on the ever-changing neighborhood of the downtown east side? Uh, it's a good positive influence in the, in the neighborhood. There's a lot of things going on down here, positive, negative, inconsequential. Um, but any neighborhood, doesn't matter where you are in this city or any other city in the world, positivity is a good force, you know. It's a good force to flip people to, like, away from doing negative things. And I think uh, we are, it's a pretty obvious deal that art, music, skateboarding, expression, getting together, having a good time, those are all good things, and, you know, like, um, probably nobody really chooses to be hitting a crack pipe all day or sticking a needle in there, and they just somehow find themselves there. And I think that um, for people who need to find their, uh, their own unique way in the world, SBC offers that without all the sort of potential negativity that can come with some of the, I guess, poorer choices, you could say. <clears throat> you never let any, or uh, you never let any other stores in Vancouver hold any S or any Skull Skates stock. Why is that, and what changed your mind with SBC? Uh, the reason we don't let anybody else in Vancouver carry Skull Skates is because we're total power-hungry douchebags and we like to control the situation. No, the reason is is because we usually end up trying to find somewhere where there's cheap rent, and cheap rent usually means somewhere that's not very centrally located. And with every shop that's open over the years, they mostly carry the same stuff. And so what we need in order to get people to come to our place, which oftentimes is not in the middle of the city, is something unique. And what's unique for us is skull skates. Um, the reason that we agreed to have SBC carry some of the stuff was just because of all the support that SBC had shown Skull Skates like right from the beginning of the project. And it just seemed like, I think um, it's a good fit, you know, I mean, to me, a big energy drink or a big kind of faceless corporation would not be a good partner for SBC. Um, most people that sort of grew up or hung around or even just are new to Vancouver kind of get the idea that Skull Skates is a pretty locally based deal and we're pretty grassroots and so it's just uh, seemed like a really good fit, you know, that's, and that's the reason for it. Um, do you have any, any stories from the old Smiling Booty years that stick out? Oh, there's so many, but the first one that comes to mind real quick is I remember somewhere or another in here there was a, uh, one of these big old, you know the metal traffic signs? No left turn or something like that. <laughs> anyway, I found one. There was one hanging out around inside here. And then I guess at the time, I'm not sure what I was thinking, but I thought it'd be a pretty funny idea to start kind of throwing it up in the air and spinning it and catching it, which worked good for about three or four times. And on the fourth or fifth time, I'm probably sure there's a scar, yeah. It came down and it just hit right in between my fingers and opened that shit up like an envelope. I looked in there and saw like, just white meat and like weird veins and look like tentacles and shit, right? And then nothing happened for a bit and then eventually it just started squirting fucking blood like a Monty Python movie, right? <laughs> and, I, and, I, and like a knucklehead, I taped it up and waited till the next morning to go to the hospital and fuck yeah, it hurt. It kind of hurts now, right, when I talk about it. <laughs> but yeah, plenty of good crazy stuff. Igor thrashing on people, you know, like and just, it was pretty out of control in them days. I mean, it was, it was a different scene here then, um, but it wasn't a different scene here then, you know what I mean? It's the same, it's the same on many levels and it's different on some, but yeah. What tripped me out was when DOA played here at the SBC, at SBC, the current sort of incarnation of the original Buddha. And it was a little bit surreal to be standing in the same place those decades later. Um, seeing like Joey Shithead still just kick ass and it was like hair on the back of my neck kind of standing up so that was a good moment. Is uh, there, <clears throat> there a different vibe from now, from now, from then till now when you come in here? Do you... uh, yeah, I'd say the vibe's a little bit more welcoming. I mean, the early days of the Smiling Buddha were great, but I think for some punk people who got into punk rock, they didn't, we hadn't quite figured it out. We thought that you were supposed to sort of be mean and and some people thought that you should be violent and like, it wasn't, uh, hmm, how could I put it into words? I think generally speaking, SBC now has, 
it's it's better because it's it's retained that original spirit of the smiling Buddha, but it seems to me like it's more inclusive. Um, it's it seems to me like it's a place where people can come and, in particular, girls. You know, females can come here and feel safe, and I think that was not the case in the late '70s and mid '80s when I was coming here. Not that I didn't see girls, I saw lots of them, but I I get the feeling that it's a little bit more welcoming now than it was in those days. And of course. The big difference is there's a skate ramp in here now, and that makes it about 200% better. Uh, what would you change about the place? Uh, the, the dudes who run it are kooks. I'd get rid of them straight away. Maybe replace them with some pretty girls. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I don't. I don't can't see what I change about it, man. I mean, to me, the sound system's amazing. The dude who does the sound, Cecil, who's connected with the original scene here, incredible. Uh, you know, one thing, I, don't, I can't say that this would necessarily be a, a way that you can change it, but I think, and, and I know this because I ran an all-ages club for about 13 months one time called the Nappy Dugout, and I would like to see more all-ages things here, but I know it's such a difficult thing to pull off, you know, because if you're trying to pay the rent and pay the bands and pay the sound guy and pay the cost of being here on just charging a kid six bucks to get in, it's very, very difficult. Um, other than that, I can't see any any changes. I mean, it seems like it's just working beautifully the way that it is, you know. Um, what's your favorite show that you saw back in the day, and then the favorite show with the new, with SBC? I used to like the fuck bands back in the day, you know, like uh, Rude Norton and the Sick Ones, and I mean, of course, Subhumans were always great to see here. The original um, three-piece lineup of DOA, incredible. Uh, for current shows, Geez, I guess that DOA show is going to have to be up there too. Um, I don't know. I can't think of specific shows, but but bands like one of the bands that really impressed me here was Making Strangers. Um, I've loved some of the art shows. I really liked the uh, I really liked the Be the Bev Davies photo show that was done here. And I don't know. They kind of honestly the new stuff all becomes a little bit of a blur. I think that. As you get older, like I am a crotchety old dude, your brain doesn't work so good, so you're not super good at making new memories. Um, but when you were young and your brain wasn't so addled, you can actually form memories, you know, and those kind of tend to stick in there. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're great, man. The, I, I love the art shows and I love the live shows and having DJs and, um, and just the mix, you know, the fact that there doesn't seem to be much in the way of limits as far as musical styles and art styles that are presented here. I think that's really important, you know. Um, it's just going back for the opposite underground, but do you, uh, you have any shout outs or thank yous or anyone you want to, anyone think about you'd like to, that you'd like to thank? Or what am I thanking for? Who am I thanking? Yeah, whoever. Is there any thanks, sort of thanks for my mom and dad for making me? Uh, my older brothers, I wasn't supposed to be here. My older brothers apparently had blown up the condoms like balloons. And my parents got home from a party and then there were no condoms. And so thanks, mom and dad. And uh, I don't know, I guess thanks for everybody who's ever supported skateboarding and supported art and supported music because I mean, I want to say thanks for supporting Skull Skates, but I don't think that's exactly accurate. I think it's more like thanks for supporting uh, independent art and independent music and just anything that's worthwhile and then that's and that's not so anything that comes from the bottom up and not from the top down. You know, it's things that are things that come from people's hearts and not from something that's been pushed on them through some kind of marketing or something. You know. Thanks for supporting independent thought. You know. right. How many skateboards do you own? I own uh, oh. I own a half skateboard. Yeah. No, I own a few, couple, several hundred. Of. Oh. I'm a pack rat. I've been hanging out in, <laughs> you know, thrift shops since I was about ten, and I started kind of picking up old skateboards really early on. So yeah, it, it's a lot. The the eventual plan is to do some kind of skateboard museum, and. Uh, I don't know I'm sure how or where or when that would happen, but that's on the uh, that's on the big list, the long agenda. I think I'm good. I think yeah, I want to head back to the thank you list though. Just yeah. Thanks for Andrew and Malcolm for reviving and 
really reinventing SBC, and a thanks for all the volunteers that help out here too. I think that's one of the things that really blows my mind. Well, not blows my mind, but I just I'm stoked because people work here and volunteer and help a lot of these shows go down, and that's because they see what Andrew and Malcolm have done, and they want to be a part of it and they want to get back to it too. So I think that's pretty rad. So yeah, thanks to everybody who's been involved with SBC.